May I please the, the tribunal? <clears throat> when the tribunal rose Friday, I had just reached the point in my discussion of the aggression against the USSR, where with the campaign in the West at an end, the Nazi conspirators had begun the development of their plan to attack the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Preliminary high-level planning and action was in progress. Hitler had indicated early in November that more detailed and definite instructions would be issued. These would be issued as soon as the general outline of the Army's operational plans had been submitted to him and approved by him. We had thus reached the point in the story indicated on the outline submitted last Friday as part three, Plan Barbarossa. By the 18th of December, 1940, the general outline of the Army's operational plans having been submitted to Hitler, the basic strategical directive to the high command of the Army, Navy, and the Air Force for Barbarossa, Directive Number 21, was issued. This directive <coughs> marks the first time the plan to invade the Soviet Union was specifically referred to in an order, although the order was classified top secret. It also marked the first use of the code word Barbarossa to denote this operation. The directive is number 446 PS and was offered in evidence in the course of my own opening statement as USA Exhibit number 31. Since it, <coughs> since it was fully discussed at that time, it is, I believe, sufficient now, <coughs> military call to the tribunal, two or three of the more significant sentences in that document. Most of these sentences appear on page one of the English translation. One of the most significant, I believe, is this sentence with which the order begins. The German armed forces must be prepared to crush Soviet Russia in a quick campaign, even before the end of the war with England. On the same page, it is stated, Preparations requiring more time to start are, if this has not yet been done, to begin presently and are to be completed by 15 May 1941. Where does that come? Oh, I see it. Just, just yes. below. Very well. And then, great caution has to be exercised that the intention of an attack will not be recognized. The directive then outlined the broad strategy on which the intended invasion was to proceed. And the parts <clears throat> that the various services, Army, Navy, and Air Forces, were to play therein and call for oral reports to Hitler by the commanders in chief, closing as follows. Five. That's on page two. I am expecting the reports of the commanders in chief on their further plans based on this letter of instructions. The preparations planned by all branches of the armed forces are to be reported to me through the high command, also in regard to their time, signed by Hitler and initialed by Jodl Keitel Dolomont, and one illegible name. It is perfectly clear 
both from the contents of the order itself, as, as well as from its history, which I have outlined, that this directive was no mere planning exercise by the staff. It was an order to prepare for an act of aggression, which was intended to occur, and which actually didn't occur. The various services which received the order certainly understood it as an order to prepare for action and did not view it as any hypothetical staff problem. This is plain from the detailed planning and preparation which they immediately undertook in order to implement the general scheme set forth in this basic directive. So we come to the military planning and preparation for the implementation of Plan Barbarossa. The Naval War Diary for 13 January 1941 indicates the early compliance of the OKM with that part of Directive Number 21, which ordered progress in preparation to be reported to Hitler through the high command of the armed forces. This entry in the war diary is document C-35 in our numbered series, and I offered an evidence as Exhibit USA 132. This document contains a substantial amount of technical information concerning the Navy's part in the coming campaign and the manner in which it was preparing itself to play that part. I feel, however, that it will be sufficient for the establishment of our point that the Navy was actively preparing for the attack at this early date to read only a small portion of the entry into the record beginning on page one of the English translation, <coughs> which is page 401 of the diary itself. The entry reads, 30 January 1941, page 401 of the diary. Seven, talk by IA about the plans and preparations for the Barbarossa case to be submitted to the high command of the armed forces. I should note that IA is, in this case, the abbreviation for a deputy chief of naval operations. Then follows a list of the Navy's objectives in the war against Russia. Under the latter, Many tasks for the Navy are listed, but I think one is sufficiently typical to give the tribunal an idea of all. I quote from the top of page two of the English translation, two objectives of war against Russia. D, to harass the Russian fleet by surprise blows as one lightning-like commitments at the outbreak of the war of Air Force units against strong points and combat vessels in the Baltic, Black Sea, and Ice Sea. The purpose of the offer of this document is merely that it indicates the detailed thinking and planning which was being carried out to implement Barbarossa almost six months before the operation actually got underway. It is but, a, but another piece in the mosaic of, a, of evidence which demonstrates beyond question of doubt that the invasion of the Soviet Union was one of the most cold-bloodedly premeditated attacks on a neighboring power in the history of the world. Similarly, the Naval War Diary for the month of February contains at least several references to the planning and preparation for the coming campaign. 
Extracts of such references are contained in document C-33, which I now offer in evidence as Exhibit USA-133. I think it will be sufficient to quote for the record, as typical, the entry for 19 February 1941 which appears at page three of the English translation and at page 248 of the diary itself. In regard to the impending operation Barbarossa, for which all S-boats in the Baltic will be needed, a transfer of some can only be considered after conclusion of Barbarossa operations. On the 3rd of February, 1941, the Führer held a conference to assess the progress thus far made in the planning for Barbarossa. The conference also discussed the plans for Sonnenblume, which was the code name for the North African operation, Sunflower. Attending this conference were, in addition to Hitler, the Chief of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, the Defendant Keitel, the Chief of the Armed Forces Operations Staff, the Defendant Yodel, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, Brauschitz, the Chief of the Army General Staff, Halder, as well as several others, including Colonel Schmutt, Hitler's adjutant. The report of this conference is contained in our document number 872 BS which I now offer as Exhibit USA 134. <coughs> During the course of this conference, the Chief of the Army General Staff gave a long report about enemy strength as compared with their own strength and the general overall operational plans for the invasion. This report was punctuated at various intervals by comments from the Führer. At page four of the English translation of the conference plan, which is at page five of the German original, there is an interesting extract, which although written in a semi-shorthand form, is at least sufficiently clear to inform us that elaborate timetables had already been set up for the deployment of troops, as well as for industrial operations. I quote, the intended time period was discussed with a plan. First deployment, Staffel, Aufmarch Staffel. Transfer now, front Germany, east. Second, deployment Staffel, Aufmarsch Staffel, from the middle of March, will give up three div divisions for reinforcements in the West. Army groups and Army High Commands are being withdrawn from the West. There are already considerable reinforcements, though still in the rear area. From now on, Attila, I might state here parenthetically that this was the code word for the operation for the occupation of unoccupied France. Attila can be carried out only under difficulties. Industrial traffic is hampered by transport movements. From the middle of April, Hungary will be approached about the march through. Three deployment staffels from the middle of April. <coughs> Felix is now no longer possible as the main part of the artillery is being entrained. Parenthetically, Felix was the name for the proposed operation against Gibraltar. In industry, the full capacity timetable is in force. 
No more camouflage. From 25-4 to 15-5, forced Offels to withdraw considerable forces from the west. Zaloa, or Sea Lion, Zaloa, I should say, was the code word for the planned operation against England and Marita, which we shall see a little later in the quotation, was the code word for the action against Greece. Zaloa can no longer be carried out. That's the operation against England. The strategic concentration in the East is quite recognizable. The full capacity timetable remains. Eight Merida divisions complete the picture of the disposition of forces on the plan. CNC Army requested that he no longer have to employ five control divisions for this, but might hold them ready as reserves for the commanders in the West. Fuhrer, when Barbarossa commences, the world will hold its breath and make no comment. This much, I believe, when read with the conference conclusions, which I, which I shall read in a moment, is sufficient to show that the Army, as well as the Navy, regarded Barbarossa as an action directive and were far along with their preparations even as early as February of 1941, almost five months prior to 22 June, the date the attack was actually launched. The conference report summarized the conclusions of the conference insofar as they affected Barbarossa as follows. I'm now reading from page six of the English translation, which is on page eight of the German. Conclusions. One, Barbarossa. The Fuhrer, on the whole, was in agreement with the operational plan. When it is being carried out, it must be remembered that the main aim is to gain possession of the Baltic states and Leningrad. The Führer B, the Führer desires that the operation map and the plan of the disposition of forces be sent to him as soon as possible. C, agreements with neighboring states who are taking part may, may not be concluded until there is no longer any necessity for camouflage. The exception is Romania with regard to the reinforcement of the Moldau. D, it must at all costs be possible to carry out Attila, auxiliary measure. E, the strategic concentration for Barbarossa will be camouflaged as a feint for, for Zaloa the sub and the subsidiary measure, Marita, or Greece. On 13 March 1941, the defendant Keitel signed an operational directive to Fuhrer Order 21, which was issued in the form of directives for special areas. This detailed operational order is number 447PS in our numbered series, and I now offer it as <coughs> Exhibit USA 135. This order, which was issued more than three months <coughs> in advance of the attack, indicates how complete were the plans on practically every phase of the operation. Section one of the directive is headed area of operations and executive power and, and outlines who is to be in control of what and where. It states that while the campaign is in progress, in territory through which the Army is advancing, the Supreme Commander of the Army has the executive power. 
During this period, however, the Reichsführer SS is entrusted with special tasks. This assignment is discussed in paragraph 2B, which appears on page one of the English translation and reads as follows. B, in the area of operations, the Reichsführer SS is, on behalf of the Führer, entrusted with special tasks for the preparation of the political administration, tasks which result from the struggle which has to be carried out between two opposing political systems. Within the realm of these tasks, the Reichsführer SS shall act independently and under his own responsibility. The executive power invested in the Supreme Command of the Army, OKH, and in agencies determined by him shall not be affected by this. It is the responsibility of the Reichsführer SS that through the execution of his tasks, military operations shall not be disturbed. Details shall be arranged directly through the OKH with the Reichsführer SS. The order then states that in time, political administration will be set up under commissioners of the Reich and discusses the relationship of these officials to the army. This is contained in paragraph 2C and paragraph 3, parts of which I should like to read. C, as soon as the area of operations has reached sufficient depth, it is to be limited in the rear. The newly occupied territory in the rear of the area of operations is to be given its own political administration. For the present, it is to be divided according to its genealogical basis and to the positions of army groups into North Baltic countries, center, White Russia, and south, Ukraine. In these territories, the political administration is taken care of by commissioners of the Reich who receive their orders from the Führer. Three, for the execution of all military tasks within the areas under the political administration in the rear of the areas of operations, commanding officers who are responsible to the supreme commander of the armed forces, OKW, shall be in command. The commanding officer is the supreme representative of the armed forces in the respective areas and the bearer of the military sovereign rights. He has the task of a territorial commander and the rights of a supreme army commander or a commanding general. In this capacity, he is responsible primarily for the following tasks. A, close cooperation with the commissioner of the Reich in order to support him in his political task. B, exploitation of the country and securing its economic values for use by German industry. Ending the quote. The directive also outlines the responsibility for the administration of economy in the conquered territory, a subject I shall develop more fully later in my presentation. This provision is also in section one, paragraph four, which I shall read. For the Führer has entrusted the uniform, uniform direction of the administration of economy in the area of operations and in the territories of political administration to the Reich Marshal, who has delegated the chief of the V. Rue Amt with the execution of the task. Special orders on that will come from the OKW V. Rue Amt. The second section deals with matters of personnel, supply, uh, Mr. and... Mr. Alderman, um, excuse me. could you tell us at some time who these people are 
Who is the Reich Marshal? The Reich Marshal is Goering. Goering? The defendant, Goering. And uh, who was the Reichsführer of the SS at that time? Himmler. Himmler? Himmler, yes. The second section deals with matters of personnel, supply, and communication traffic, and I do not read it here. Section three of the order deals with the relations with certain other countries and states in part as follows. I'm reading from page three of the English translation. Roman three. Regulations regarding Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, and Finland. The necessary arrangements with these countries shall be made by the OKW together with the Foreign Office and according to the wishes of the respective high command in case it should become necessary during the course of operations to grant special rights. Applications for this purpose are to be submitted to the OKW. The document closes with a section regarding Sweden which is also on page three of the English translation. Roman four, directives regarding Sweden. Twelve, since Sweden can only become a transient area for troops, no special authority is to be granted the commander of the German troops. However, he is entitled and compelled to secure the immediate protection of railroad transports against sabotage and attack. The chief of the high command of the armed forces signed Keitel. As was hinted in the original Barbarossa order, the original direct directive number 21, which I discussed earlier, the plan originally contemplated that the attack would take place about the 15th of May. 1941. In the meantime, however, the Nazis found themselves involved in a campaign in the Balkans and were forced to delay Barbarossa for a few weeks. Evidence of this postponement <coughs> is found in a document which bears our number C-170. This document has been identified by the defendant Raider as a compilation of official extracts, C-170. As a compilation of official extracts from the Naval War Staff War Diary. It was prepared by naval archivists. Mr. Alderman, you said 170. It's 170, isn't it? 170. Yes. Yes. It was prepared by naval archivists who had access to the admiralty files and contains file references to the papers which were the basis for, such, for each entry. I offer that document in evidence as Exhibit USA 136. Although I shall refer to this document again later, I should like at the moment to read only an item which appears in the second paragraph of item 142 on page 19 of the English translation and which is in the text and in a footnote on page 26 in the German original. This item is dated 3 April 1941 and reads as follows. Balkan operations delayed Barbarossa at first for about five weeks. All, all measures which can be construed as offensive actions are to be stopped according to the Bureau of order. By the end of April, however, things were sufficiently straightened out to permit the Fuhrer to definitely set D-Day as the 22nd of June more, more than seven weeks away. Document number 873PS 
in our series is a top secret report of a conference with the chief of the section, Lance Verteidigung, of the Wehrmacht Führungsstab on 30 April 1941. I now offer you that document in evidence as Exhibit USA 137. I think it will be sufficient to read the first two paragraphs of this report. <clears throat> One, Timetable Barbarossa. The Führer has decided Action Barbarossa begins on 22 June. From 23 May, maximal troop movement performance schedule. At the beginning of operations, the OKH reserves will have not yet reached the appointed area. Two, proportion of actual strength in the plan Barbarossa, sector north, German and Russian forces approximately of the same strength. Sector middle, great German superiority. Sector south, Russian superiority. Early in June, practically three weeks before D-Day, preparations for the attack were so complete that it was possible for the High Command to issue an elaborate timetable showing in great detail the, disposi the disposition and the missions of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. This timetable is document number C-39 in our series and I offered now as Exhibit USA 138. This document was prepared in 21 copies, and the one offered here was the third copy, which was given to the High Command of the Navy. Page one is in the form of a transmittal and reads as follows. Top, sec top military secret, Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, number 44842, diagonal 41. Top military secret, WFST, diagonal ABTLIOP. Führer's headquarters, no date, top secret, only through officer, 21 copies, third copy, OBDM, IOP 0084541, received 6 June, enclosures. The Fuhrer has authorized the appended timetable as a foundation for further preparations for Barbarossa. If alterations should be necessary during execution, the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces must be informed. Chief of Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, signed Keitel. I shall not uh, bother to read you the distribution list, which indicates where the 21 copies went. The next two pages of the document are in the form of text outlining the state of preparations. Mr. Mr. Alderman, the tribunal does not think it necessary that you should read all those preliminary matters at the head of these documents, yes. top secret, only through officer, yes. and then the various uh, uh, reference numbers and figures. Because You're when wrong. you've given the identification of the document, those yes. are merely formal. Yes. The next two pages of the document are in the form of text outlining the state of preparations as of the 1st of June, 1941. The outline is in six paragraphs covering the status on that date under six headings. General, negotiations with friendly states, Army, Navy, Air Force, and camouflage. I think it's un unnecessary to read into the record any of this textual material. 
The remainder of the paper is in tabular form with six columns, headed from left to right at the top of each page. Date, serial number, Army, Navy, OKW, remarks. Most interesting among the items appearing on this chart, uh, in Mr. my Robert, opinion. Did you read the uh, first paragraph? Because that seems to be important. There's yes. two lines there. Under the heading General. Page two. I beg your pardon, page, page two. two, yes. Yes, sir. General, the timetable for the maximum massing of troops in the East was put into operation <coughs> on the 22nd May. Yes. Most interesting among the items appearing on this chart, in my opinion, are those appearing on pages 9 and 10. These are at page 8 of the German version. At the bottom of page 9, It is provided in the columns for Army, Navy, and Air Force that, and I quote, till 1300 hours, latest time at which operation can be canceled. <coughs> Under the column headed OKW appears the note that, and again I quote, canceled by code word Altona or further confirmation of start of attack by code word Dortmund. In the remarks column appears the statement that, I quote, complete absence of camouflage of formation of army point of main effort. Concentration of armor and artillery must be reckoned with. Is the second entry on page 10 of the chart for the 22nd of June, under serial number 31, gives a notation which cuts across the columns for the Army, Air Force, Navy, and OKW, and provides as follows under the heading Invasion Day. H hour for the start of the invasion by the Army and crossing of the frontier by the Air Forces, 0330 hours. In the remarks column, it states, Army assembly, independent of any lateness in starting, owing to weather on the part of the Air Force. Other parts of the chart are similar in nature to those quoted and give, give as I have said, great detail concerning the disposition and missions of the various components of the armed forces. On 9 June 1941, the order of the Führer went out for the final reports on Barbarossa to be made in Berlin on 14 June 1941, which was just eight days before D-Day. This order is signed by Hitler's adjutant Schmunt and his C-78 in our numbered series. I offer it in evidence now as Exhibit USA 139. I read from page one the matter under the heading Conference <coughs> Barbarossa. One, the Führer and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces has ordered reports on Barbarossa by the commanders of Army groups, armies, and naval and air commanders of equal rank. Two, the reports will be made on Saturday, 14 June 1941, at the Reich Chancellery, Berlin. Three, timetable A, 11 hours, silver for Fox. B, 12 hours to 14 hours, Army Group South. C, 14 hours to 15.30 hours, lunch party for all participants in conference. D, from 15.30 hours, Baltic, Army Group North, Army Group Center, in this order. Signed by Schmund.
There is attached a list of participants and the order in which they will report, which I need not read. The list includes, however, a large number of the members of the High Command and General Staff Group as of that date. Among those to participate were, of course, the defendants Goering, Cadill, Yodel, and Raider. I believe that the documents which I have introduced and quoted from are more than sufficient to establish conclusively the premeditation and cold-blooded calculation which marked the military preparations for the invasion of the Soviet Union. Starting almost a full year before the commission of the crime, the Nazi conspirators planned and prepared every military detail of their aggression against the Soviet Union with all of that thoroughness and meticulousness which has come to be associated with the German character. Although several of these defendants played specific parts in this military phase of the planning and preparation for the attack, it is natural enough that the leading roles were performed, as we have seen, by the military figures, the defendants Goering, Keitel, Jürgen, and Rader. Next, preparation for plunder. Plans for the economic exploitation and spoliation of the Soviet Union. Not only was, was there this detailed preparation for the invasion from a purely military standpoint, but equally elaborate and detailed planning and preparation was undertaken by the conspirators to ensure that their aggression would prove economically profitable. A little later in my presentation, I shall discuss with the tribunal the motives which led these conspirators to attack without provocation a neighboring power. I shall at that time show that the crime was motivated by both political and economic considerations. The economic basis, however, may be simply summarized at this point as the greed, greed of the Nazis for the raw material, food, and other supplies which their neighbor possessed and which they conceived of themselves as needing for the maintenance of their war machine. To these defendants, such a need was translated immediately into a right, and they early began planning and preparing with typical care and detail to ensure that every bit of the plunder which it would be possible to reap in the course of their aggression would be exploited to its utmost benefit, to their utmost benefit. I've already put into the record evidence showing that as early as August of 1940, General Thomas, the chief of the V. Rue Amt, received a hint from the defendant Goering about a possible attack on the USSR, which prompted him to begin considering the Soviet war economy. I also said at that time that I would, would later introduce evidence that in November 1940, eight months before the attack, General Tomah was categorically informed by Goering of the planned operation in the East, and preliminary preparations were commenced for the economic plundering of the territories to be occupied in the course of such operation. Goering, of course, played the overall leading role in this activity by virtue of his position as the head of the four-year plan. Thomas describes his receipt of the knowledge and this early planning at page 369 of his draft, which is our document 2353 PS, introduced earlier as exhibit USA number 35. 
The part I shall now read is at pages 10 and 11 of the English translation. In November 1940, the chief of V. Ru, together with the secretaries of state Kerner, Neumann, Backer, and General von Hannigan, were informed by the Reich Marshal of the action planned in the East. By reason of these directives, the preliminary preparation for the action in the East, preparations for the action in the East, were commenced by the office of V. Ru at the end of 1940. The preliminary preparations for the action in the East included, first of all, the following tasks. One, obtaining of a detailed survey of the Russian armament industry, its location, its capacity, and its associate industries. Two, investigation of the capacity of the different big armament centers and their dependency one on the other. Three, determine the power and transport system for the in industry of the Soviet Union. Four, investigation of sources of raw materials and petroleum, crude oil. Five, preparation of a survey of industries other than armament industries in the Soviet Union. These points were concentrated in one big compilation, the war economy of the Soviet Union, and illustrated with detailed maps, etc. I'm still quoting. Furthermore, a card index was made containing all the important factories in Soviet Russia and a lexicon of economy in the German Russian language for the use of the German War Economy Organization. For the processing of these problems, a task staff, Russia, was created, first in charge of Lieutenant Colonel Luther, and later on in charge of Brigadier General Schubert. The work was carried out according to the directives from the chief of the office respectively, I suppose, the groups of departments for foreign territories, Ausland, with the cooperation of all departments, economy officers, and any other persons possessing information on Russia. Through these intensive preparative activities, an excellent collection of material was made, which proved of the utmost value later on for carrying out the operations and for administering the territory. That ends the quotation. By the end of February 1941, this preliminary planning had proceeded to a point where a broader plan of organization was needed. And so General Toma held a conference with his subordinates on 28 February 1941 to call for such a plan, a memorandum of this conference, classified top secret and dated 1 March 1941, was captured and is our document 1317 PS. I now offer it in evidence as U.S. Exhibit 140. The text of this memorandum reads as follows. The general ordered that a broader plan of organization be drafted for the Reich Marshal. Essential points. One, the whole organization to be sub subordinate to the Reich Marshal. Purpose, support and extension of the measures of the four-year plan. Two, the organization must include everything concerning war economy accepting only food, which is said to be made already a special mission of State Secretary Baker. Three, clear statement 
that the organization is to be independent of the military or civil administration. Close coordination, but instructions direct from the central office in Berlin. Four, scope of activities to be divided in two steps. A, accompanying the advancing troops directly behind the front lines in order to avoid the destruction of supplies and to secure the removal of important goods. B, administration of the occupied industrial districts and exploitation of economically complementary districts. And then on the bottom of page one, five, in view of the extended field of activity, the term war economy inspection is to be used preferably instead of armament inspection. Six, in view of the great field of activity, the organization must be generously equipped and personnel must be correspondingly numerous. The main mission of the organization will consist of seizing raw materials and taking over all important concerns. For the latter mission, reliable persons from German concerns will be interposed suitably from the beginning. Since successful operation from the beginning can only be performed by the aid of their experiences. For example, lignite, ore, chemistry, petroleum. <coughs> After the discussion of further detail, details, Lieutenant Colonel Luther was instructed to make an initial draft of such an organization within a week. Close cooperation with the individual sections in the building is essential. An officer must still be appointed for the Vien Rue, with whom the operational staff can remain in constant contact. V is to give each section chief and Lieutenant Colonel Luther a copy of the new plan regarding Russia. Major General Schubert is to be asked to be in Berlin the second half of next week. Also, the four officers who are ordered to draw up the individual armaments inspections are to report to the office chief at the end of the week. Signed, Heyman. Heyman, who signed the report, is listed among those attending as a captain and apparently the junior officer present. So presumably it fell naturally enough in his operational order of 13 March 1941. This order is number 447 PS and I have already offered it in evidence earlier as exhibit USA 135. At that time, I quoted the paragraph in the order in which it was stated that the Führer had entrusted the uniform direction of the administration of economy in the area of operations and political administration to the Reich Marshal, who in turn had delegated his authority to the chief of the V. Rue Amt. The organizational work called for by General Thomas at the meeting on 28 February, apparently proceeded apace. And on 29 April 1941, a conference was held with various branches of the armed forces to explain the organizational setup of the economic staff Oldenburg. Oldenburg. Oldenburg was the code name given to this economic counterpart of Plan Barbarossa. The report of this conference is captured document number 1157 PS, and I now offer it in evidence as Exhibit USA 141. Section 1 of this memorandum deals with the general organization of economic staff Oldenburg as it had developed by this time, 
and I should like to read most of that section into the record. The report begins, conference with the branches of the armed forces at 10 hundred hours on 29th April 1941. One, welcome. Purpose of meeting, introduction to the organizational structure of the economic section of this action. Barbarossa Oldenburg. As already known, the Führer, contrary to previous procedure, has ordered for this drive the uniform concentration in one hand of all economic operations and has entrusted the Reich Marshal with the overall direction of the economic administration in the area of operations and in the areas under political administration. The Reich Marshal has delegated this function to an economic general staff working under the director of the Industrial Armament Office, Chief Viru Ahn. Under the Reich Marshal and the economic general staff, the supreme central authority in the area of the drive itself is the, and then a heading, Economic Staff Oldenburg for Special Duties, under the command of Major General Schubert. His subordinate authorities, geographically subdivided, are five, five economic inspectorates, 23 economic commands, 12 sub-offices, which are distributed among important places within the area of the economic command. These offices are used in the military rear area. The idea is that in the territory of each army group, an economic inspectorate is to be established at the seat of the commander of the military rear area, and that this inspectorate will supervise the economic exploitation of the territory. The military rear area on the one hand, and the battle area proper, and the rear area of the army on the other hand. In the last, e economic matters are dealt with by the fourth econ 4B of the army headquarters command. That is the liaison officer of the industrial armament office within the supreme command of the armed forces at the army headquarters command. For the battle area, he has attached to him technical battalions, reconnaissance and recovery troops for raw materials, mineral oil, agricultural machinery, in particular tractors, and means of production. In the territory between the battle and the military rear area, the rear area of the army, group four econs at the various field commands are placed at the disposal of the liaison office, officer of the industrial armaments office in order to support the army headquarters command specialists responsible for supplying the troops from the country's resources and for preparing the subsequent general economic exploitation. While these units move with the troops Economic inspectorates, economic commands, and their sub-offices remain established in the locality. The new feature inherent in the organization under the command of economic staff Oldenburg is that it does not only deal with military industry, but comprises the entire economic field. Consequently, all offices are no longer to be designated as offices of the military industries or armaments, but quite generally as economic inspectorates, economic commands, etc. This also corresponds with the internal organization of the individual offices, which from the economic staff Oldenburg down to the economic commands requires a standard subdivision into three large groups. That is, Group H, dealing with troop requirements, armaments, industrial transport organization. Group L, which concerns itself with all questions of feed and agriculture. And Group W, 
which is in charge of the entire field of trade and industry, including raw materials and suppliers. Further, questions of forestry, finance and banking, enemy property, commerce and exchange of commodities, and manpower allocation. <coughs> Secretary of State Backer is appointed Commissioner for Food and Agriculture in the General Staff. The problems falling within the field of activities of Group W are dealt with by General von Hanneken. The remainder of the document deals with local subdivisions, personnel, and planning problems, and similar details, which <coughs> I think it unnecessary to put into the record. These documents portray vividly the coldly calculated method with which these Nazis prepared months in advance to rob and loot their intended victim. They show that the conspirators not only planned to stage a wanton attack on a neighbor they had pledged to security, but that they also intended to strip that neighbor of its food, its factories, and all its means of livelihood. As I shall point out more fully later, when I discuss the question of motivation, these men made their plans for plunder, being fully aware that to carry them out would necessarily involve ruin and starvation. <coughs> Next, the politics of destruction, preparation for the political phase of the aggression. As I have already indicated, and as I shall develop more fully later in this discussion, there were both economic and political reasons motivating the action of the conspirators in invading the Soviet Union. I've already discussed the extent of the planning and preparation for the economic side of the aggression. <coughs> Equally elaborate planning and preparation was engaged in by the conspirators to ensure the effectuation of the political aim of their aggression. It is, I believe, sufficient at this point to describe that political aim as the elimination of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a powerful political factor in Europe and the acquisition of Lebensraum. For the accomplishment of this purpose, the Nazi conspirators selected as their agent the defendant Rosenberg. As early as the, as the 2nd of April, 1941, Rosenberg, or a member of his staff, prepared a memorandum on the USSR. This memorandum speculates on the possibility of a disagreement with the USSR, which would result in a quick occupation of an important part of that country. The memorandum then considers what the political goal of such occupation should be and suggests ways for reaching such a goal. The memorandum is number 1017 PS in our series, and I offer it in evidence now as exhibit USA number 142. Beginning with the second paragraph, it reads, under this subject, the USSR. A military conflict with the USSR will result in an extraordinarily rapid occupation of an important and large section of the USSR. It is very probable that military action on our part will very soon be followed by the military collapse of the USSR. The occupation of these areas 
would then present not so many military as administrative and economic difficulties. Thus arises the first question. Is the occupation to be determined by purely military and or economic needs? Or is the laying of political foundations for a future organization of the area also a factor in determining how far the occupation shall be extended? If so, it is a matter of urgency to fix the political goal which is to be attained, for it will without doubt also have an effect on military operation. If the political overthrow of the Eastern Empire in the weak condition it would be at the time is set as the goal of military operations, one may conclude that first, the occupation must comprise areas of vast proportion. Two, from the very beginning, the treatment of individual sections of territory should, as regards administration, as well as economics and ideology, be adapted to the political ends we are striving to attain. Three, again, extraordinary questions concerning these vast areas, such as, in particular, the ensuring of essential supplies for the continuance, continuation of the war against England, the maintenance of production, which this necessitates, and the great directives for the completely separate areas should best be dealt with altogether in one place. <clears throat> it should again be stressed here that in addition, all the arguments which follow, of course, only hold good once the supplies from the area to be occupied, which are essential to greater Germany for the continuance of the war, have been assured. Anyone who knows the East sees in a map of Russia's population the following national or geographical units. A, Greater Russia with Moscow as its center. B, White Russia with Minsk or Smolensk as its capital. C, Estonia, Lat Latvia, and Lithuania. D, the Ukraine and the Crimea with Kiev as its center. E, the Don area with Rostov as its capital. F, the area of the Caucasus. G, Russian Central Asia or Russian Turkestan. Ending the quote. The memorandum then proceeds to discuss each of the areas or geographical units thus listed in some detail, and I shall not read those pages. At the end of the paper, however, the writer sums up his thoughts and briefly outlines his plan. I should like to read that portion into the record. It is at the bottom of page four of the English translation under the heading summary. The following systematic constructional plan is evolved from the points briefly outlined here. One, the creation of a central department for the occupied areas of the USSR to be confined more or less to wartime. Working in agreement with the higher and supreme Reich authorities, it would be the task of this department, A, to issue binding political instructions to the separate administration area, having in mind the situation existing at the time and the goal 
which is to be achieved. B, to secure for the Reich supplies essential to the war from all the occupied areas. E, to make preparations for and to supervise the carrying out in main outline of the primarily important questions for all areas, as for instance, those of finance and funds, transport, and the production of oil, coal, and food. Two, the carrying out of sharply defined decentralization in the separate administration area, grouped together by race or by reason of political economy for the carrying out of the totally dissimilar tasks assigned to them. As against this, an administrative department regulating matters in principle and to be set up on a purely economic basis is at present envisaged, as is at present envisaged, might very soon prove to be inadequate and fail in its purpose. Such a central office <coughs> would be compelled to carry out a common policy for all areas dictated only by economic consideration. And this might impede the carrying out of the political task. And in view of its being run on purely bureaucratic lines, might possibly even prevent it. The question therefore arises whether the opinions which have been set forth should not, purely for reasons of expediency, be taken into consideration from the very beginning when organizing the administration of the territory on a basis of war economy. In view of the vast spaces and the difficulties of administration which arise from that alone, and also in view of the living conditions created by Bolshevism, which are totally different from those of Western Europe, the whole question of the USSR would require different treatment from that which has been applied in the individual countries of Western Europe. Ending the quotation. Is that signed? It is not signed, no, sir. Well, is it in Rosenberg's handwriting? Found in the Rosenberg file. Is there anything to indicate that he wrote it? No, I, I said it was evidently prepared either by the defendant Rosenberg or under his authority. We captured the whole set of Rosenberg files, <coughs> which constitute really a large library. <coughs> <clears throat> it is evident that the presently envisioned administration operating on a purely economic basis to which this memorandum objects was the economic staff Oldenburg, which I've already described as having been set up under Goering and General Thomas. Rosenberg's statement, if this be his statement, of the political purpose of the invasion and his analysis of methods for achieving it apparently did not fall on deaf ears. By a Führer order dated 20 April 1941, Rosenberg was named Commissioner for the central control of questions connected with the East European region. This order is part of a correspondence file 
regarding Rosenberg's appointment, which has been given the number 865 PS in our series. I ask that this file, all relating to the same subject and consisting of four letters, all of which I shall read or refer to, be admitted in evidence as Exhibit USA 143. The order itself reads as follows. It is the first item on the English translation of 865 PS. I name Reichleiter Alfred Rosenberg as my commissioner for the central control of questions connected with the East European region an office which is to be established in accordance with his orders is at the disposal of Reichleiter Rosenberg for the carrying out of the duties thereby entrusted to him. The necessary money for this office is to be taken out of the Reich Chancellery Treasury in a lump sum. Führer's headquarters, 20th April, 1941, the Führer signed Adolf Hitler. Reich Minister and Head of Reich Chancellery signed Dr. Lammert. This particular copy of the Führer's order was enclosed in a letter which Dr. Lammers wrote to the defendant Keitel requesting cooperation for Rosenberg and asking that Keitel appoint a deputy to work with Rosenberg. This letter reads as follows. It's on the stationery of the Reich Minister and the head of the Reich Chancellery, Berlin, 21 April, 1941. I omit the salutation. Herewith, I am sending you a copy of the Führer's decree by which the Führer appointed Reichleiter Alfred Rosenberg as his commissioner for the central control connected with the East European region. In this capacity, Reichleiter Rosenberg is to make the necessary preparations for the probable emergency with all speed. The Führer wishes that Rosenberg shall be authorized for this purpose to obtain the closest cooperation of the highest high On page 22 of the English translation, it says, at 6 June, Ambassador in Moscow reports, Russia will only fight if attacked by Germany. Situation is considered in Moscow much more serious than up to now. All military preparations have been made quietly as far as can be recognized, only defensive. Russian policy still strives, as before, to produce the best possible relationship to Germany as good. The next one is entry 169, also on page 22, the date 7 June. From the report of the ambassador in Moscow, all observations show that Stalin and Molotov, who alone are responsible for Russian foreign policy, are doing everything to avoid a conflict with Germany. The entire behavior of the government 
as well as the attitude of the press, which reports all events concerning Germany in a factual, indisputable manner, support this view. The loyal fulfillment of the economic treaty with Germany proves the same thing. Now that's the German ambassador. May it please the tribunal. I had just <coughs> put in evidence our document 1456 PS as Exhibit USA 148. I now read from that document on page one. Following is a new conception of the Führer, which Minister Tote has explained to me and which has been confirmed later on by Field Marshal Keitel. Paragraph one, the course of the war shows that we went too far in our autarchical endeavors. It is impossible to try to manufacture everything we lack by synthetic procedures or other measures. For instance, it is impossible to develop our motor fuel economy to a point where we can entirely depend on it. All these autarchical endeavors ask for a tremendous amount of manpower, and it is simply impossible to provide it. One has to choose another way. What one does not have but needs, one must conquer. The commitment of men which is necessary one single time will not be as great as the one that is currently needed for the running of the synthetic factories in question. The aim must also be to secure all territories which are of special interest to us for the war economy by conquering them. At the time the four-year plan was established, I issued the statement where I made it clear that a completely autarchical economy is impossible for us because the need of men will be too great. Nevertheless, my solution was always to provide the necessary reserves for missing stocks, uh, respectively to secure the delivery in wartime through economic alliances. On this uh, macabre note, I come to the end of the story of this aggression. We have seen these conspirators as they planned, prepared, and finally initiated their wanton attacks upon the Soviet Union. Others will carry on the tale and describe the horrible manner in which they waged this war of aggression and the countless crimes they committed in its wake. When I consider the solemn pledge of non-aggression, the base and sinister motives involved, the months of secret planning and preparation, and the unbelievable suffering intentionally and deliberately raw. When I consider all of this, I feel fully justified in saying that never, never before, and God help us, never again, in the history of relations between sovereign nations has a blacker chapter been written than the one which tells of this unprovoked invasion the territory of the Soviet Union. For those responsible, and they are here before you, 
the defendants in this case, it might be just to let the punishment fit the crime. 